Oh, oh good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Uh, today's speaker will be Dr. Juan Olazagasti from uh, Pediatric Gastroenterology. Dr. Olazagasti comes to us from the beautiful island of Puerto Rico. He completed his training at Miami Children's Hospital and his GI fellowship at Indiana University Medical System. He has been with the Carilion System since 2006, and his areas of interest include motility disorders and eosinophilic esophagitis. In addition to his clinical and teaching duties, he is actively involved in research in uh, constipation, eosinophilic esophagitis management, and IBS. Please welcome Dr. Ula Thank you, and good morning. The title of this particular lecture, um, The Road to Rome, was actually Jamie's um, idea, and uh, it's, it's um, a summary, and all right, thank you. So um, um, it's, it's titled Road to Rome because um, we are going to be looking at functional abdominal disorders that actually the criteria for this was originated um, in Rome, and it's not a documentary about Rome. So the Rome criteria, it's actually uh, roots from 1980 with a um, gastroenterologist named um, George Engel, where he studied a, a biopsychosocial model. He developed this model to actually um, look at the early life factors that affects uh, genetics, culture, environment, influencing the psychosocial aspects of the person, like life, life stressors, personality traits, psychological state how we cope with the environment, and how much social support we have from our family and our um, um, uh, primary care um, uh, takers. But also affecting physiological function, which is very important, and it's actually the result of all this conglomerate of uh, factors in the person. There is a definitive brain and GI tract interaction, and um, uh, as, as part of the outcome, then there is the need for um, care for, for um, health care, work on the health of the daily function, our quality of life is affected, and also, not to say the least, and not to say the least, um, the cost, the health care cost involved. So these three um, all gastroenterologists got together and they developed a series of communications through email at first, and then they actually got together in Rome where wanted to discuss this particular conglomerate of symptoms that was affecting patients with not necessarily a disease, but something that they, they thought it was a function-related um, problem, and they got together to actually characterize all these particular um, uh, symptoms. And um, this is a biopsychosocial concept model, as I said, early life uh, events affecting psychosocial factors, physiology all together with brain and gut interaction triggering functional gastrointestinal disorders. So back to Rome, the first um, criteria was established in 1994. Our pediatric um, criteria was developed in, with the Rome II in 1999, 2000. And the last Rome um, criteria for pediatrics and adults was developed in 2016. GI, the functional GI disorders is defined mostly as a disorder of the gut brain interaction, classified by GI symptoms related to motility problems visceral hypersensitivity, altered mucosa and immune function, altered gut microbiota, our, our own bacteria, and the CNS, central nervous system processing. Sorry. So we have three major areas, and I'm going to be talking about child and adolescent functional abdominal disorders. I'm not going to talk about infant and toddler functional GI disorders. Um, the three main areas are involved in nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, 
and defecation disorders. We're gonna to go to nausea and vomiting disorders and the first mock question. This is a 10-year-old female with three episodes of acute unremitting nausea and non-bilious vomiting lasting for two days in the last six months. Debilitating symptoms, unable to eat or drink fluids, seen in the ER three times, requiring IV fluids, history of headaches, but not, not necessarily related to vomiting. Each episode linked to some degree of stressors, school basketball games, and no other problems with fever, family uh, sickness. Uh, once the vomiting resolves, she's back to her baseline with no major abdominal pain and occasional nausea. The most likely diagnosis is A, migraine headaches, B, abdominal migraine, C, cyclic vomiting syndrome, D, functional vomiting, E, functional nausea. Any ideas? I don't have any prices today, I'm sorry. <laughs> no candy. <laughs> Any clues? Well, the correct answer is C, cyclic vomiting syndrome. And very, very interesting condition. It's mostly symptoms of sudden nausea and vomiting lasting for hours and days with a six month period. Two or more episodes during this particular six months. They have a stereotypical characterization which each patient has their own menu of symptoms that repeat. You can have them, it's in cycles, so, so, so sometimes every two weeks, sometimes every month, sometimes every three months, but not all the time they read the book. So you may actually, uh, you may not see a, a cycle all the time. And after medical evaluation, the symptoms cannot be explained by any other medical condition. So cyclic vomiting, the, the um, prevalence is not high, it's 0.2 to 1% in, in the U.S. Um, the actual pathophysiology behind it is associated with release, stress release of hypothalamic corticotropin releasing hormone that then affect the vagus nerve in, um, in our um, uh, um, medulla and then trigger uh, actual symptoms of gastric stasis, so the, the actual stomach technically mostly stop, and that's what you see, this severe nausea, severe vomiting. There's also associated mutations suspicious to be linked to the mitochondria, so there is actually an energy problem with the mitochondria where there is some polymorphism, genetic polymorphism associated with the inheritance, mostly to the mother. It's not totally clear, but that's the suggestion. Um, and, and that's why some of the medications that we're gonna be discussing will be helpful for cyclic vomiting syndrome. So therapy in itself, cyproheptidine, which is an H1 agonist, and antagonist, I'm sorry, is in less than five years of age, the dose of our cyproheptidine is um, from 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilo per day divided in two doses. Amitriptyline in children greater than five years of age, and the dose for amitriptyline is 0.5 milligram per kilo per day at night. And propranolol can be used in any age, but propranolol, the beta blocker, it, it, it's, it's thought to help in decreasing splasmic circulation into the GI tract and decreasing the stimulation of our GI tract with help um, in symptoms is, in my opinion, is the most effective treatment uh, for cyclic vomiting um, for, as prophylaxis, okay? So cyproheptidine, amitriptyline, and propranol are good for prophylaxis. Acupuncture has been helped with concomitant treatment, and there is, we have an, an, a knee Q, a Q and point. It's actually a pressure point, three fingers breath below our palm in the ventral side in between the tendons, and that particular area is used for acupuncturists as a nausea and vomiting uh, help. Um, and there are actually wristbands that can be used. The one of, of the brand is C, C brand, and uh, I'm talking about C, this particular product I forgot to mention that I have no disclosures for this <laughs> particular um, uh, lecture. Um, so, so that seems to be quite effective as a help with other, other 
medications. Cognitive behavioral therapy is very helpful because many or most of our functional disorders root on stressors, psychosocial distress, and, and, uh, and uh, behavioral therapy is, is excellent. CoQ10 and L-carnitine are, are helpful being uh, used with either cyproheptidine or amitriptyline, and CoQ10 helps to channel some of the electrons through our respiratory chain in the mitochondria, so helps feeding the mitochondria, which has this uh, suspected dysfunction. The same with um, L-carnitine. It helps to move long-chain uh, fatty acids through the inner membranes of the mitochondria, then helping uh, fat uh, oxidation. So these are adjunctive therapy. Sumatriptan is very helpful with the start of the, of the, of the episode, of the, of the acuteness of cyclic vomiting. It's given either subcutan uh, subcutaneous or intranasal. So the subcutaneous uh, form is helpful in a good 34% of patients. And the actual subcutaneous is, is helpful in up to 54% of, of patients with cyclic vomiting. So very effective to avoid these terrible days. So these particular patients will go into so much distress and they end up in the emergency room, so it's debilitating. Um, there's always stressors associated with this problem. I had a patient way back in my practice that this adolescent girl will shut down and then she will end up in the emergency room with severe vomiting and also pain as part of, the, of her symptomatology. And at, back then, the ER gave her one dose of morphine, which calmed her down. Not the best treatment, but knowing about our concerns with morphine. But that was the trick to help her. And one dose will do um, actually revert her, her symptoms. So after channeling her through therapy, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, she did significantly better to actually recognize and actually help herself avoid and channel her stressors. The next topic is functional nausea. And functional nausea and functional vomiting has been developed lately with the, with the 2016 um, criteria because the, the, um, the, there was no definitive area describing this patient with nausea and vomiting that had no abdominal pain. The, the main symptom was nausea and vomiting with nothing else. So, this is bothersome nausea for at least twice a week for a two-month period, not related necessarily to meals, and, and, not, and not always associated with vomiting. And again, all the work was negative, but the no abdominal pain was the main, the main um, key on these particular patients. Same with functional vomiting. One or more episodes of vomiting per week, no associated eating disorder or induction of vomiting or rumination, and then again, no abdominal pain. So these are the patients that you see that will go to school and they, they have to rush to the bathroom because they get all of a sudden have to vomit. Some of them vomit right there, but otherwise they're fine. Same with the nausea. They have nausea every day and, and, and they just basically have nothing. As you examine them, there's no abdominal pain and nothing else related to, to these particular um, uh, conditions. Autonomic symptoms are found on any functional GI disorder. So you see that you're talking to the patient in your office and all of a sudden they're telling you that aside from their symptoms, they have either tachycardia, they feel that they're gonna faint, they, they become pale, they have dizziness, all this auto, orthostatic syndrome without having POTS, without having postural orthostatic uh, tachycardia syndrome. And of course, sleeping tends to help the symptoms you, you, you get the history that on weekends they sleep through the morning and they have no, no, no symptoms at all. The reason is, of course, they're sleeping, they're not waking up in the morning, they're not going to school, so they're not facing their regular daily uh, life. So I think that that's one of the major factors related to this particular help. So sleeping helps, but of course, it's because they're not waking up early that particular day. Indication for further evaluation, severe vomiting suggesting the central nervous system uh, abnormality like a tumor, 
GI anatomy problems like, for example, malrotation, gastroparesis, intestinal pseudo obstruction. And intestinal pseudo obstruction is actually a disease from birth. So they have abdominal distension, they have this vomiting, on feeding to intolerance. So it's, it's more involved. So, but keep in mind particular symptoms and scenarios that suggest not just a functional disorder, but more, mostly a disease in itself. The treatment for functional nausea and vomiting, uh, there's no research data, like it, just because it was diagnosed recently, uh, there, it was actually um, a, um, established recently in the last couple of, um, couple of years, three years, um, but, but extrapolated from other um, conditions, uh, functional conditions, behavior therapy and hypnotherapy is helped. And this is actually the hypnotherapy comes from studies in patients with um, chemotherapy, children with chemotherapy that they get help with, with um, uh, hypnotherapy uh, before the actual chemotherapy and during chemotherapy. Gastric electrical stimulation, this is for severe symptoms and it's mostly used for um, functional dyspepsia we will be talking in, 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 the, in the near future. Um, and this is actually electrodes that goes between the body and antrum of the stomach. And um, they, they have electrical uh, uh, pulses that will increase gastric emptying and help the symptoms of nausea, of gas, uh, vomiting, and just pain. Not necessarily they need to have gastroparesis to be uh, helped with this. So the actual trigger of the electric pulse is actually intra-abdominal. So this is very, very involved, requires a basic, basically surgery, putting these particular uh, stimulators. In adults with um, insulin-dependent diabetes, mellitus, gastroparesis is very effective, very effective, very helpful. But it has, it's, it's just reserved for severe um, symptoms, and we don't have this uh, available here. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's not available in any other center. It's, it's, it's quite uh, specific for, for mostly motility centers related to GI diseases. Rumination is another interesting uh, uh, topic, which includes the repeated regurgitation and reshoeing of or expulsion of food after a meal. Not doesn't happen during sleep. Doesn't happen. Uh, they don't retch. So basically, they just bring their. Um, they just increase abdominal pressure contraction of the abdominal muscles, they bring the EG junction, the esophagogastric junction into the thorax and then they'll bring it out. These particular patients will either swallow their, their, their food or spit it out. And there is a kind of like vast difference between patients because some of them will just spit out all the time and it becomes really disruptive. There is always stress associated with this particular condition but um, uh, you also see it on post-infectious gastroparesis or post-infection situation. For example, this is the kid that will have an acute gastroenteritis, and after the gastroenteritis, they will continue vomiting off and on, and they link these particular symptoms of vomiting, and they learn how to actually do this contraction, and it ends up with self-stimulation gratifying in some degree and very disruptive because they actually have, in my opinion, some, um, some emotional gain because when they're doing it in, in, in class, they, they, they call the attention of everybody because they are actually going back and forth to the, to the, to the trash can. So very problematic. Um, one of the, the best treatments when in severe cases where they disrupt the daily life is interdisciplinary approach. So these are children that I actually hospitalized, and with a team of psychologists, um, diet, dietitians, pediatric GI, um, child therapy, recreational therapy, massage therapy, they help these kids um, get out of, out of the hospital and, and back to their usual life, but very effective. Area of is the next topic. Um, These this are actually, uh, purposely swallow of air in most patients with severe anxiety. And this will happen for a, a two month, at least for a two month period. And what, they get distended, they belch a lot, they have a lot of gas. And you also see it on patients with uh, cerebral palsy or CNS 
uh, um, abnormalities of kids with um, uh, spastic quadriplegics, but um, in the patients with not CNS problems, it's mostly anxiety related. I have a patient, um, an adolescent girl, with a um, with with aerophagia, and this girl in the morning will be flat, and towards the evening it looked like she was pregnant. So she was hospitalized because of thinking of obstruction, and. Um, my associate back then saw this patient, and um, <laughs> he told the family that they, don't need, they didn't need a GI doctor, they need a psychiatrist. You know? And the family got very upset. So, <laughs> so, so I, I was on call the next day, so I actually had to channel the, 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 the actual situation. I actually finally got the, her through therapy, and she went home, and she got really helped. But, but, but it was the trigger of anxiety making this habit of, of swallowing air. So behavioral therapy is very important, psychotherapy, extremely helpful, and also benzodiazepines. It, the sound has, has some help with these particular uh, symptoms, although we know how careful we need to be with benzo and um, our, our patient, any patient, with, because of psychological dependence. And, um, and, and, and physical dependence as well. The next area is functional abdominal disorders, um, abdominal pain disorders, and we're gonna go for our question here. 12-year-old male with recurrent epigastric abdominal pain mostly after eating with early satiety, no bloating at least once a week for the last two months. The pain is a major symptom. Intermittent nausea, occasional vomiting, no harbor, no reflux, no dysphagia, no weight changes. Normal exam. So the most likely diagnosis is A, functional vomiting, B, functional abdominal pain not otherwise specified, C, functional nausea, D, abdominal migraine, E, functional dyspepsia. Any ideas? I know it's I know we have not talked about most of these conditions yet, so it's very difficult. So the, the actual correct answer is, is functional dyspepsia. That is correct. No, no candy for you, Scott. I'm sorry. <laughs> but but that's, that's absolutely correct, functional dys, uh, dyspepsia. And functional dyspepsia is this bother for, bothersome symptoms of either epigastric abdominal pain, early satiety, postprandial fullness, and will happen at least four times a month for at least two months of symptoms. Um, there is classified by two subtypes. One is postprandial distress syndrome, and the other one epigastric pain. So the postprandial distress syndrome patients will have this, they stop eating, they, they get bloated, they, they get distended, and they, they, they have this particular nausea associated with that. The second part, the epigastric pain syndrome, is mostly epigastric pain as the major symptom, even though they can have nausea and other, other particular uh, uh, symptoms, but it's more epigastric pain. And the pain does not radiate to the back like happens with ulcers or, or, or end pancreatitis. And um, it's, it's to the point that these patients are debilitated. The actual incidence of functional dyspepsia is not very high either. It's around 0.2%. Um, and um, in, 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 in the U.S., in children. And um, the, the mechanism of this is an actual motor dysfunction of this, uh, mostly the stomach. So they have problems with accommodation of, 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 the, of, of gastric uh, contents after a meal. And half of them will have increased gastric emptying, half of them will have slow gastric emptying. So with all these symptoms, they get really, really distressed. and. Um, the, there is also some, some genetic predisposition, so there is some inheritance in, involved with uh, functional dyspepsia. And um, the, these particular patients um, are treated with food avoidance. So greasy foods, spicy foods, um, um, caffeine will, will bother them. Non-steroid and anti-inflammatory um, drugs will, will, will also irritate as well. Functional dyspepsia with nausea, cyproheptidine will, will be helpful. Um, it, it actually, what it does, cyproheptidine is an anti-serotonergic, so it actually helps the accommodation of the, of the stomach um, with, with a meal. 
um, address psychological factors like behavioral therapy. Hypnotherapy is helpful as well. Antidepressants like um, tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline, but in low doses. PPIs, H2 blockers have some role to help some of them, and gastric electrical stimulation. I forgot to mention another of the pathophysiologic factors. These patients um, can also um, be, um, um, the, uh, there's, there's some um, allergies that will trigger some of these particular dysfunctions, like cow milk protein allergy. 4% of these patients will have cow milk protein allergy, and, um, and, and they, will, they will be affected by that. Post-bacterial, not viral, post-bacterial infections will cause delayed gastric emptying. So this is the typical patient that, in most part, can start with after, after an acute gastroenteritis type of scenario. Always keep in mind alarming features for gastro um, GI tract disorders. For example, family history, celiac, IBD, H. pylori, peptic ulcer. If there is localized pain on the right upper, right, uh, right lower quadrant, dysphagia, odinophagia, suggesting more like eosinophilic esophagitis, GERD uh, esophagitis, persistent vomiting that does not stop in between. There's no rest on the, on the persistent vomiting. GI blood loss, nocturnal diarrhea. We've seen also in, in ulcerative colitis quite a bit. Arthritis, suggesting more rheumatoid arthritis. Perirectal disease, mostly Crohn's disease. Involuntary weight loss, deceleration of growth, delayed puberty, unexplained fever. All these are red flags for diseases not related to functional GI disorders. Even though we do know that some diseases could be also affected by functional abdominal disorders. For example, we have patients with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, that they have irritable bowel syndrome. And let me tell you, you really have to learn what is, what is irritable bowel syndrome affecting the patient in certain times and what is the actual disease itself. Otherwise, you're treating the wrong <laughs> particular condition in, those, in, in that particular patient. So it's very interesting that not, you can see these this functional GI disorders associated with, with any other condition. So be careful just to separate one another and treat, the, treat them properly. The next question is a 14-year-old female with recurrent abdominal pain in the lower abdomen associated with defecation four times a month for at least two months. Changing bowel habits with bouts of loose, no bloody stools, alternating um, every two days. She'll have hard stools and, and, and lasting one or two days. The triggering factors, spicy food, stress, um, no weight loss, no fever, no joint swellings, no malaise, normal exam except some abdominal discomfort on, on, ex, uh, abdominal discomfort on exam. So what is the likely diagnosis? A, functional constipation. B, functional diarrhea. C, irritable bowel syndrome. D, abdominal migraine. E, functional dyspepsia. Any ideas, any clue? Scott? <laughs> C, that is correct. Man, I need to get you a bag of candy or something after we finish here, buddy. That's great. <laughs> Excellent. So irritable bowel syndrome. It's, it's basically abdominal pain is the major symptom, and it may happen four times per month for at least two months. And it's actually defec defecation-linked abdominal pain has a lot to do because of rectal hyperalgesia. Uh, hyper and they have uh, changes in the frequency of the bowel movement, sometimes too much, sometimes too infrequent, and the appearance of stool, so, so sometimes um, diarrhea, sometimes constipation, or sometimes just one of them um, uh, with, ex with some, uh, some particular patient. So either they have diarrhea predominant or constipation predominant. They have the mixed um, um, IBS or actually not necessarily related to anything specific for diarrhea or constipation. And we'll go to that in the next couple of slides. The, um, the incidence is 1 or 3 percent. Even though there, there is some data that suggests a higher frequency in children, but, but the most, the, the, the most is, is 1 or 3% in our population in the U.S. Um, the pathophysiology is a disorder, again, of the gut-brain axis and visceral hypersensitivity. So this, they have both rectal hypersensitivity, gastric hypersensitivity, and, and so anything that uh, distends the GI tract will 
will affect these patients. So they have low um, pain threshold for pain, for motility. Um, you, you see post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome, so there are cytokines released after an infectious process that affects interleukin uh, function, and they will continue to have IBS symptoms. Some of them will get better within several m months. Some of them will st uh, stay with the irritable bowel syndrome for long, long term. Um, there's alteration of, of gut microbiome. For example, it's been uh, found that patients with irritable bowel syndrome has a, some decrease in the, um, some species of bacteria like Clostridium, um, Dorea species, and, um, and, and they have decreased um, amounts of, of bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, and, uh, and, and that affect their, 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 their actual gut function as well with some degree of low degree of irritation to the bowel. You can see also patients under, after surgery that will develop symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome because that creates dysfunction in the GI tract. Affects more uh, children early in life, but they have multiple surgical procedures will develop this dysfunction long term. This is a diagram of how our diet, our dysbiosis, which actually links for what I mentioned about infectious processes affecting, but also our own pathogenic bacteria or commensal as a baseline trigger of problems. Then motility abnormalities, whether visceral hypersensitivity associated with um, our dysfunction, and then our genetic life events with infections as well, disorder pain processing, and not to say psychological distress. There is an immune response associated with the different aspects of irritable bowel syndrome with some interleukin cytokines changes. There is also some degree of in, uh, increased permeability with um, increased mucosa um, secretion of fluids, and then stimulations of enteric nerve with IBS symptoms. So it's a multifactorial problem. This is our dear Bristol scale, and I brought this to explain the next slide. So the seven type of stools, from one and two, the most constipated type of stools, six and seven, the more loose to diarrhea, um, type of stools, three, four, and, and five are more acceptable as okay. And <laughs> um, talking about irritable bowel syndrome and the different types of irritable bowel. So patients with irritable bowel syndrome, constipation predominant, will have more than 25% of stools in the Bristol one and two. The um, diarrhea uh, predominance has more into the six and seven. More than 25% of the stools is, are between uh, Bristol six and seven, so mostly towards the other end. The mix between one and six, and they have uh, more than 25% of their stools between them, and the, and the unspecified, it's less than 25% of any diarrhea or constipation. So essentially, you have these four subclassifications of IBS. The treatment probiotics, there are studies on lactobacillus GG that actually help in attaching to the mucous membrane of the colon, displacing um, gas-producing um, bacteria, displacing also um, a um, bile-splitting bacteria. It also has a function in receptors released by our epithelium in the, in the GI tract, which actually helps with the um, visceral hypersensitivity. So these receptors are mostly opioid and cannabinoid um, receptors. So it increases that and it helps in adaptation on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on that particular visceral hypersensitivity. Um, so probiotics are very helpful, uh, adding, adding um, good bacteria. So uh, peppermint oil, it actually has uh, some degree of motility help. Um, it works as, as, as can, calcium channel blocking type and relaxing the bowel itself. It has some direct effect on as um, antifungal and antibacterial, and, it, and so it helps also the uh, hyper a sensitivity in patients with irritable bowel. FODMAP diet is the, the uh, food, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. 
These are fermentable carbohydrates that in some people will become very irritant because they are producing more gas. So gluten-free diet is considered low, I'm sorry, high on FODMAT um, fermentable carbohydrates. So many people with a low glu um, gluten diet feel better for that reason, not because they necessarily have celiac disease. Behavioral therapy is very helpful because we do know that patients with irritable bowel syndrome have a lot of stress or personality traits. Not all the time it's just stressors. It's how the child or the adolescent views their world and how their typical characteristic of personality, if they're a higher achiever or if they have really, really perfectionist or if they worry a lot, you see all bringing up the words um, of, um, of into the channel into the GI tract. Antispasmodics, dicyclamine, um, hycosamine, a, a, a pamine will be helpful. In patients with IBS, constipation predominant, psyllium fiber has some benefit. Uh, and in the combination of um, the mixed IBS, diarrhea, and constipation, um, Benefiber is dextrin. What is on apple pulp, um, that particular fiber, they, 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 they call it, um, uh, uh, is fully dissolvable and it's actually very beneficial for those particular patients as well. Amitriptyline in low dose has a very helpful benefit, mostly at night. Patients with um, diarrhea predominant will be helpful with, uh, will, will help with amitriptyline. And there's some uh, role on SSRIs in relation to patients with anxiety triggering, triggering uh, irritable bowel syndrome. This is a fairly new device that is actually retroauricular, and it actually has to be inserted in this area and actually uh, releases some electrical impulses that help um, cranial nerves 5, 7, 9, and 10, and actually helps abdominal pain. The, what I think that the downside of this is that number one, is invasive. Number two, that is just limited. You can use it for five days, and after five days, the battery are, are gone. So I don't know details of how much it costs, how much insurance approval. I, will, I don't use it. Um, we don't think that um, any of us will have, have used it, but it's something for severe cases of abdominal discomfort and um, um, this, uh, and actually debilitating uh, pa patients by irritable bowel syndrome. Next mock question, 12-year-old with, with six years of episodic abdominal pain, intermittent headaches, and self-induced vomiting. The, the vomiting is to help the pain. And during this episode, there's confusion, aggressive behavior, or self-mutilation. So they're actually like psychiatric type of um, symptoms. Not associated with, um, only associated with pain, emesis, and dehydration. Otherwise, the patient is otherwise fine with no aggressive behavior. Negative work on porphyria, metabolic disorders like zero amino acids, upper endoscopy, colonoscopy, not, not much going on there. They treated her with famotidine with uh, some help, but nothing major either. So big psychosocial component of sexual molestation, parental separation, and, and, and attending a new school. So what is the likely diagnosis? A, cyclic vomiting syndrome, B, migraine headaches, C, conversion reaction, D, IBS, E, abdominal migraine. One that we have not discussed yet, <laughs> abdominal migraine. And this is a severe case of abdominal migraine. And uh, the abdominal migraine is actually um, present in up to, uh, from one to 4% of, of, of children in the U.S. It's, um, sorry. it's severe pain, paroxysmal, sudden, lasts for one hour or many, many hours. It's either periumbilical, midline, mostly, but also can be diffuse, which is kind of confusing. Um, stereotypical for the patient. So these particular patients, like um, cyclic vomiting syndrome, they will have the same symptoms, the same menu of symptoms that happens and recurred. In between this, these episodes, they're, they're pretty much okay. Um, so abdominal migraines um, has also two more criteria, anorexia, um, nausea, vomiting, 
headaches, photophobia, or pallor. So you need two more of this to, as part of the criteria. And they have all linked to cyclic vomiting and migraine headaches. So abdominal migraine is mainly abdominal pain as the main symptom. Cyclic vomiting is the nausea and vomiting as the, same, as, the, as the main symptom. And migraine headaches is mostly migraines as the main symptom. Pathophysiology, very similar to CVS and migraine. Um, the triggers, fatigue, stress, uh, traveling is a big deal for, for these particular patients. Relieve, uh, the relieving factors are mostly rest, sleeping, and uh, the mechanism is through excitatory amino acids, neurotransmitters, serotonin, that we, it are released in, in, in significant amounts and triggering all this um, variety of symptoms. There is an increase in irritation in the temporal lobes, in the amygdala, and in the hypothalamus. And these particular patients, like the big net, that she had this type, uh, psychotic type of symptoms are mostly linked, looks like, to the amygdala itself. So medications that increase GABA in the and GABA aminobutyric acid in, in the brain will help appease this severe release of these particular neurotransmitters. Differential diagnosis, bowel obstruction, GP, uh, JPA obstruction, pancreatitis, familiar Mediterranean fever, porphyria, severe symptoms or, or conditions related to abdominal pain psychiatric disorders as well. The treatment, low-dose amitriptyline, and we usually use for functional disorders um, between 10 and 25 milligrams. You can use, it, it's usually one milligram per kilogram per, per day at night. Propranolol has a, has a help, um, cyproheptidine as well, and valproic acid. Valproic acid was used in this particular patient that I presented in the question. They give IV valproic acid and once they achieve um, uh, the, the normal levels, um, the blood levels, then the symptoms start easing and off. And um, once she was in appropriate levels, she was released home on, on auto, auto medication. So it increases, and the reason is it increases GABA in the brain, and that's why it is it's helpful. So it's no use for everybody. Pisotifen. It's not used in the, in the U.S., mostly Canada and England, but it's a good anti-serotonin and antihistamine that I just wanted to mention because there are studies on that particular drug. So the next one and the last one for this particular abdominal pain disorder says functional abdominal pain not otherwise specified. This is on patients with actual toilet, they should be toilet trained because they're seen in four years and older. And I'm sorry. Going back, wrong. This, this, they have mainly abdominal pain, and it's episodic. It's continued and doing psychological, doing physiological events. So, for example, these patients tend to have problems um, at any time, not necessarily when they're menstruating, not necessarily after eating. And, um, and, and the diagnosis is kind of like exclusion from other functional disorders. So, you don't see criteria for irritable bowel, functional dyspepsia, or abdominal migraines. And the pathophysiology, stress is the main, the main factor. But also, as I mentioned before, children or adolescents that are really personality-linked, uh, weariness and, and, and that as well. Divorce, hospitalization, bullying, child abuse, all that related. They, they have some degree of upper GI dysfunction where they have some slow gastric emptying, with liquid milk, this is all related to, to um, research, and there is decreased anthrocontraction anthro associated with discomfort and pain. But the most important thing, how family copes with this particular pain on the patient. If the child sees that the family is totally stressed and worried that the child has cancer or the child is gonna die or, uh, or, or they have really a pain, too much attention to the pain, then the child will actually uh, be in the worst scenario to actually cope with the pain. I will have a, a debilitating um, end because they just dwell on the pain. And you see that a lot with families where you interview them and you see the parent and the child ch exchanging how much pain or how much symptoms they have with, it's really 
sad because otherwise they don't get better. They don't, they don't resolve the problem because they actually dwell on the pain. And the more attention they put on the pain, the more the pain they, they will have. A lot of them will have somatization of symptoms, headaches, dizziness, tiredness, pallor, all these, all these characteristics of, of uh, autonomic and somatic symptoms. Keep in mind um, alarming symptoms that I mentioned before. And this is how our own coping with the pain or our pain appraisal makes a big difference. For example, there is a pain episode that is affected by psychosocial stressors or altered GI physiology where they have an, an infection or anything. How we appraise the pain or how the patient appraises the pain and how they cope with the pain, depending on risk factors of family genetics, early life events, on protective factors of culture, social support, end up with either a maladaptive response with disability, chronic pain, or normal development, no disability, and the pain will come, but they will resolve, and it's not that the pain is not gonna come, it's the way they see the pain that helps the most in this particular patient. The treatment, antispasmodics, amitriptyline, citalopram, the SSRI has some, some, some help, and with SSRIs, of course, we have to always disclosure the risk for um, suicidal ideation, in other, mostly in adolescents. So I always mention that in terms of, of using of citalopram. And, and we prescribe some of these SSRIs because we have had to learn because many of these particular patients have anxiety. In my personal opinion, this is something that I use for a limited time, maybe six months, hoping I could channel them to psychology, biofeedback, and help, and then I tell the parents, if they need more help after six months, we need to channel them to a psychiatrist. So in these particular patients, I don't, it's, 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 they don't necessarily do not have an anxiety disorder, and they don't have any psychiatric type of problems, that, the ones that I treat myself with SSRIs. But um, if I see that the situation is too complex, I send them out to the, uh, the, the psychiatrist because and it's out of my, my, my expertise. Hypnotherapy has helped. Cognitive behavioral therapy, very helpful as well. The next la and last um, conglomerate of, 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 of uh, GI dysfunction disorders is defecation disorders, and there are two of them. The first one is functional constipation, and functional constipation is two or less tools per week on a four-year-old or older child. So they have to be toilet trained, and they, they have only two or less tools, um, and you need two of these criteria, at least, for diagnosis. And they, these symptoms will happen once, at least once a week for a minimum of a month. And they have pain on defecation, huge tools, withholding posture, so it's pain that triggers the, the, the withholding. Fecal incontinence at, at least once a week, and if you don't find the two particular criteria, and you do a rectal exam on, the, on these kids, you will find likely a fecal mass in the rectum, and it, it will help with diagnosis. The use of abdominal x-rays are not recommended for this particular scenario unless you cannot examine the patient appropriately and you have a question, so then there's no other doubt that an x-ray will be helpful to actually visualize how much burden of stool they have. The incidence, 13% in, in, in children, peak in toilet training, boys with higher rate of fecal incontinence, and I bet the girls here are saying, yeah, I knew that boys were very fecal incontinence. And <laughs> but not all of us. <laughs> same incidence in boys and girls. So you too have the same, the same incidence. Social, they're the same for social economic class, culture, dietary practice. So in other words, it's more pain that triggers the problem, nothing else. And, um, and the, keep in mind always all our features. I'm not gonna go into details on this because we're getting short of time. Treatment, two main steps. And uh, the first step is disimpaction. So you clean these patients. Uh, in, in, in younger kids, um, less than 10 years of age, I like Merolax, multiple doses of Merolax, and um, at least five times in one day a week. And then once they're clean, they feel the sensation of, rect uh, of the stool reaching the rectum. 
So it makes more sense for them that they need to poop because these kids keep a fecal impaction in most time. So they never make click of, I need to poop. And with rect uh, rectal distension, the sensation in the rectal, rectum decreases as well. So cleaning them at, at least once a week for four weeks, that's what I do in my practice, helps a lot. Then the maintenance with either um, Merlax, lactulose, mineral oil, or milk of magnesia are very helpful. And um, half of the patient will respond by six to 12 months. And um, again, education is the most important factor. So this is a child that you see in your office and you want to get, you, you, you want to make contact with the child, you know, make them their, your friend. So you can actually explain in the, in, in, with some type of diagram how the GI tract works so they may click what is the problem that I'm having. And once you engage with that patient, you're going to have way better success in, in treating them. Because what, what I usually tell these kids is that if they do good, I do good. So I tell them that I'm the best poop doctor in the world, and they need to help me to keep that good standard. So they love it. And some of them, if they're oppositional, if they have the behavior oppositional, and I sometimes tell them, my boss is going to fire me <laughs> if you don't do well. And I have a couple of kids that will tell me, I'm not going to do any well because I want you to be fired. <laughs> but that's absolutely correct. But engage with the patient because the, the, the success of treatment depends a lot in how we actually explain the things to the, to the family. The next condition is non-retentive fecal incontinence. And these are patients with just they poop on their pants. They have retention. They just, they just poop um, a, a full BM in their underwears. And this is related to uh, some unconscious anger, some psychiatric illnesses. Sexual abuse has been linked also to, to non-retentive fecal, fecal incontinence. So it's, it's good to keep in mind because it happens. Uh, you see that in autistics also. Um, so, so identify learning disabilities, psychosocial disturbance, et cetera. The sadness is that uh, they're difficult to treat. 29% of them will, will be successful at two years, but 5% will still have the problem at, at age 18. Um, so at the end, the take, up, the take home points here is the characterizations of pediatric functional GI disorders has evolved in the last two decades with that wrong uh, criteria. The diagnosis, and we, we have more diagnosis, more research to actually treat this patient and characterize them would help them. Removal of the dictum of no evidence of organic disease that we have in other Rome criteria has helped to avoid excessive amount of workup. So now with the dictum of after appropriate medical evaluation of symptoms cannot be attributed to another medical condition helps to, before we kind of like were pushed to do a lot of extra endoscopies, x-rays, MRIs, CTs that are not really necessary, so it's by your criteria by your cl clinical experience and by your decision, um, the extent of the work that you want to give. Re re review psychosocial risk to actually pinpoint stressors on this patient. History of physical exam, extremely important. And never forget reviewing alarming red flags of disease, which avoid my misdiagnosis of an actual disease associated um, with, with, this, with these patients with uh, uh, the symptomatology of functional disorders, which is extremely, extremely important. And um, I think this is it for, for now. Questions in the room? Because <laughs> we were fortunate to have a cardiologist here, you know, and, and like it, some of these patients come to that's us. That's true. So, and that's a very good point. Amitriptyline. You're talking about yeah, AKGs and, well, two, and all that. Two questions. One is, yeah. the, one is the utility when our pediatricians use amitriptyline. It, it's always a moving target as to what we, how we should do that. Do we get a pre pre EKG and then get a post EKG? You know, to avoid those QTC abnormalities. That's that's an issue that's not really been clear clarified in our. Population. That's one issue, and then the other issue is some of those POTS kids end up in the cardiology office because of, uh, and I don't know if you could comment on diagnostic testing that is kind of universal from your standpoint. Well, I'm glad that they share some of our patients yeah. too. You know, 
Because aside from doing echocardiograms, you know, I'm kidding. We, we try to keep them in the GI clinic as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, from a diagnostic workup, I mean, basically it's family history and baseline ECG uh, if we want to kind of see where things are going. Things like tilt table studies are not generally done in pediatrics. Uh, they don't do them at Cincinnati Children's. They don't do them at CHOP. Um, I always check with them when we're working up things like syncope. I mean, we have orthostatic numbers that we follow, so we'll do a laying down and a standing up, you know, kind of thing, and then say, okay, it doesn't really matter whether we call this POTS, orthostatic hypotension, orthostatic intolerance, you know, vasovagal syncope. It's all under neurocardiogenic syncope with a bunch of also, you know, dysautonomic uh, symptoms. And I was noticing with your diagnoses, if they came on a Tuesday and they really focus on abdominal pain, you give them one diagnosis. And they really focus on the nausea, you give them another diagnosis. And that's the same thing with us as well. So one day they've got tachycardia, one day they've got hypotension, and we've got different ICD-10 codes for that. So our, our, it's more of a clinical history taking, making sure there's not something worse going on, there's not cardiac causes that we actually need to fix or do something about. And then beyond that, it's, the medical therapy is all the same. It's, you know, midodrine, Flornaf, beta blockers, SSRIs and, and you know, extreme uh, things. We hadn't, you know, I've seen citalopram being used more often. I'm not really sure why that particular SSRI is being used more than the other ones, but I've seen that as a trend. And then um, recently we've been getting more questions about, like, CBD uh, and uh, Marinol and things yeah. like that, which, you know, so I'm opening up a, a shop, so. <laughs> and to be sincere, I, didn't, I did not see any articles on, on, on CBD. We do have cannabinoid receptors and, and, and um, as part of the hypersensitivity, and visceral hypersensitivity, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. Dr. Olazagasti, thank you for a, a really good review of functional um, GI disorders. The thing that I found most interesting is that most of them have a component of um, what you would think of as having uh, problems with perception of pain that is linked to the cognitive perception of pain. So there have been a lot, there's been a lot of work in different areas on chronic pain syndromes and hyper pain syndromes uh, that are associated with children. So regional pain syndrome or um, functional pain that is out of proportion. Many of the studies now are looking at using behavior in which case you start to discount the pain as opposed to focus on the pain for parts of their cognitive therapy. Has that been used in these GI also disorders which really are a pain perception uh, issue between your cognitive perception and your neurological perception. Yes, and, 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 I, and the, in cognitive behavioral therapy, actually the role um, linked with biofeedback is, is to actually change the, the patient's perspective and channel the, the, the thought of possible pain or pain through different scenarios so they don't actually canalize that in the wrong way but at the same time work with any problems or psychosocial dysfunction but yes it's it's actually the, the, that's what that's how cognitive behavioral therapy has the, has the, the best help because for that particular uh, situation absolutely I was noticing for the functional nausea um, you didn't mention some of the serotonergic and more classical antiemetics as therapies, and I totally get why that's not a good long term. But I would imagine a ton of these patients are being either treated with those when they go in for an acute episode or with their primary care. Is, it, is there any data to suggest that those would be less effective or not as effective in, in these functional children versus? We don't know because okay. there's not enough research data right now, but there is suspicious that, that for example, GI um, gastric accommodation has some degree of function of dysfunction in these particular patients, and and that's why the cyproheptidin helps to some degree. But let me tell you, in my experience, a lot of these patients, nothing helps, and it's very sad. Aside from well, aside from therapy, cognitive therapy, and but psychotherapy, because otherwise. And, and what is sad is that we end up doing so many case, procedures on them because the parents actually, because that's the only symptom, symptom. nausea, and they're debilitating, and they have this melancholy, many of them, not all, melancholic personality that you can, you can tell they're prone to depression, they're prone to other, 
but um, but we don't have enough data right now to actually say which one will help. And uh, and you know, I saw a girl the other day that had this band with the acupressure, and I think it works more as a placebo than anything else on her because she would not take the band for days and days and days. And a six-year-old girl, so so it tells you how much in, uh, self-influence these kids has. And this is a six-year-old, otherwise pretty much okay, but but you can tell her personality uh, is is quite melancholic. And yeah. Looks like we're out of time for today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this concludes our grand rounds for today. We're going to disconnect the phone lines now. Thank you for your attendance. Uh, next Thursday is going to be Independence Day, so we will not be having grand rounds. So we'll hopefully we'll be able to um, get the other again on July 11th. As always, you can send your questions or concerns to outreach at greenclaim.org.